Welcome to the Dividend Cafe. I am actually recording again from my apartment here in New York City where I recorded the Dividend Cafe on Friday. Although I recorded Dividend Cafe Friday and then ran out the door and then I just ran in the door and I'm recording right now. So um, it, it's become a convenient place to record quickly and leave, but actually a whole lot of action in between. But today's Dividend Cafe is a full one. There, there's a lot of different things I wanted to cover. Most of it I wrote very early this morning, but let's get the stuff that happened throughout the day today out of the way first, just in terms of today's market action. It wasn't um, an especially dramatic or eventful day. The Dow was up 69 points, which is 0.18%. The S&P was up a quarter of a point, and the NASDAQ was up a third of a point. Um, but the bond market's action is a little more interesting. The 10-year today was up four basis points, so it closed at 4.46%. But the 10-year had been at 4.7% in late April, and it got uh, as low as 4.28% last week. And then on Friday, it did come up about 13, 14 basis points. Or like I mentioned, it was up four basis points today. So bonds have sold off the last two days, but after a monstrous rally. Two things are true at once that seem very inconsistent with one another, but are both very important understanding the bond market. And when you understand the bond market, you kind of understand the whole world. Um, one is that there is a tight range that has gotten kind of set. And by tight, I mean 425 on the lower end, 475 on the higher end. Um, you may think that isn't particularly tight, but, but it is. But then at the same time, an uh, awful lot of volatility within that. Bonds that will be at 450, go up to 470, come down to 430, go up to 450. So you're having 5, 10, and, and 15 point uh, basis point swings in the yields. And that just really has to do with a lot of what we call financialization. A lot of actors that are not taking a fundamental point of view, but are trying to front run where they see things uh, going in the yield curve, uh, where they see things going with the Fed, um, and, and what that will mean for yield curve positioning. In terms of the market today, um, the top sector for the day was utilities, set, uh, was up one and a quarter percent. Uh, energy was up three quarters of a percent. But then the bottom performing sector was financials, but it was only down 39 basis points. And you had a lot of stuff in the middle, kind of around the flat line. Um, I did so much on Friday's Dividend Cafe and have been doing so much lately, as have a lot of other analysts because there's so much to kind of say about it in different ways to say it uh, re regarding the theme of top heaviness in the market. And so on Friday, I think I covered what uh, portion of the S&P 500 right now, the top three names were, the just the one NVIDIA name is, the top um, five names, the MAG7, all of these different things. But let me, let me add another data point in the mix here. The top 10 stocks in the S&P 500. So for those whose calculator is uh, unavailable or don't know where the calculator app on your phone is, 10 names divided by 500 is 2%. Um, you should know that I can do that just without a calculator. Just bragging a little here. Uh, the top 2% of the market is worth 35% of the market. So 2% of the names equal 35% of the market capitalization. In 1999, when we got to the top heaviest we'd ever been, it was 27%. So this is a simply stunning level of top heaviness. And you can use 10, 7, 5, 3, or 1 names to make that point. Um, how uh, how would we classify the divergence between an even weighted and cap weighted view of the market? This top heaviness, um, the S and P is at an all time high, and less than half of the S and P is even above its own fifty day moving average. There you go. Uh, okay, and the news this weekend absolutely heroic. 
story of the rescue of four hostages that have been held by Hamas since October 7th. The, the European Union results, if you look into specific countries, uh, uh, President Macron's party in France took on uh, some big hits, the Social Democrats in Germany. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the Socialist Party in Spain lost to the Conservative Party by over four percentage points. Um, so you had some significant right-wing moves. Now, again, by far and away, the kind of center of gravity still in the European Union is with a more centrist party hold, but with immigration and inflation as the primary issues, you saw quite a political move in some of these elections uh, at various member European countries on Sunday. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the dates and events here. I'm going to push you to dividendcafe.com. But um, my dear friend, Renee Ananow at Corbu Research, provided a list that I have bulleted in Dividend Cafe today of all of the significant geopolitical events on the calendar that lie ahead in the ne just June and July. We're really just talking about a, six weeks or so uh, from, you know, uh, Putin state visits in China, G7, G20, NATO meetings. There's a lot on the calendar with a geopolitical bend that has the potential to be quite newsworthy in the next six weeks or so. I'd recommend you check that out. Another public policy element that we got quite a few questions about, and I'm going to address it not so much as an Ask TBG question, but more just in terms of the newsworthiness of it, is this talk about the Texas Stock Exchange. Um, there is a TXSE. Movement It has raised $120 million, including significant equity capital from such big players as BlackRock and Citadel. They uh, still have SEC approvals to get. They still would want to begin listing companies as far out as 2026. It's a couple years away, but a, a lot of movement and questions have come in as to what this may mean. I think it's likely that they would uh, pr allow dual listings to allow companies already listed with the New York Stock Exchange to list both with them and New York, um, but then really try to fight more for new listing business. But there isn't a lot of new listings these days, which actually is the subject of Ask TBG, but that's a coincidence. I'll get there in a moment. Um, I think it, it's, let me put it this way. I don't think it's a non-story. Uh, but I also don't think it's yeah, at this time anything earth shattering either. There's been other exchanges that come and gone. Uh, the New York Stock Exchange first and the NASDAQ second still are the duopoly of publicly listed companies. Um, but this does seem to have some momentum. And Texas is a, a business friendly state with business friendly courts and judges. And there's a number of things that could happen here. Dallas has become a major financial center. So we'll watch the story. I don't think it has any impact to any investors right now, uh, but it, it doesn't appear to just be a headline or hype. I mean, there, there are some uh, real players involved. I'll keep you posted. Economically, the big story of the weekend was the jobs report Friday, which is what pushed bond yields up on Friday. 272,000 new jobs created, about 100,000 more than had been forecasted, uh, but the unemployment rate ticked up to 4%. The labor participation force ticked down, unfortunately, from 62.7 to 62.5%. Average hourly earnings were up 0.4% uh, on the month. They were expected to be up 0.3%. Private sector gains were the lion's share of those 272,000. It was about um, 229 of those 272. So, um, a good jobs report and better than expected, um, but again, still just little non-confirmed inconsistencies throughout the data. A lot of part-time jobs, household survey number was was not as high. So I still continue to find a lot of people uh, responding to it based on their own political priors, uh, which I just utterly refuse to do. Another economic point I want to bring up that I, I spend a little time with in Divin Cafe today is 
TSA, um, the kind of checkpoint headcount, which I don't know of a better way to know who's really flying airlines than who actually goes through the, the metal detectors. Uh, last I checked, you're not flying commercial if you're not going through that. And if you are going through it, you are flying, right? So um, it seems pretty reliable. Uh, it is basically right now well above pre-COVID highs for travel. So, you know, the 2021 numbers were quite low. Obviously, 2020, everything had been shut down. 22 still stayed low. It started picking back up. But that whole forecast about people are not going to fly again, um, and I made the analogy to when people said that after 9-11, um, has proven to be just as good of a forecast as that one was, which wasn't very good. $900 billion of commercial real estate loans are set to mature in 2024. Uh, it's about 28% of that in multifamily. Um, next year, it's closer to $600 billion. 36% of that would be multifamily. Um, second place is office. And then there's a real small amount in industrial, retail, hospitality, other commercial real estate asset classes. Multifamily is the big one. I expect it will be significant hit to margins because I don't think there's a huge incentive for a lot of the lenders to multifamily to amend and extend because I think there's mostly positive equity and positive cash flows and reasonable, fun, not great, but reasonable fundamentals in multifamily. And so the banks are going to refinance and reset rates where they can. Where office, I think you're going to see so much more amending and extending because there isn't any point in foreclosing where there is going to be distress. And so um, we're watching this closely. And you know who else I believe is? Are a bunch of PhDs that work for the Federal Reserve. Um, there's no chance that the Fed is going to raise or cut rates at the July meeting. There wasn't a chance before the jobs number on Friday. But nevertheless, when you get, you know, five different media outlets saying, well, now there's no chance that the Fed's going to do something because of a strong jobs report, it A, dishonestly pretends like there was a chance they were going to do it before. And then B, it sort of reinforces in people's minds this narrative about strong jobs being um, inflationary. And um, so there's two different things that bug me there. The first one is just an annoyance. The second one is really dangerous as a matter of policy and economic understanding. Uh, the other thing I did today in Dividend Cafe on the Fed is put a chart up um, because I want people to understand where velocity picked up a little last year having to do with the reverse repos um, being drained out of the system. We were up to about two and a half trillion and we've gotten almost down to half a trillion. There's close to two trillion of uh, reverse repos that are on deposit with the Fed that have come out. And we that money has flown in a lot of cases into assets. And I think velocity, when it is just looking at the turnover of goods and services, how many times goods and services are being bought and sold, I don't think you've seen a big upward move in velocity, but when you include money coming in like this into asset prices, I do think that that in, in, increases velocity. And um, so the chart here kind of shows that correlation. Uh, upstream energy stocks were hit last week. Crude oil itself was down over 2% of the week. It had been down more earlier in the week. It actually was up over 3% today. But I just want to point out that MLPs were up nearly 1% last week, and the midstream sector, even with uh, C Corps, was about flat. So, still kind of not only a decorrelation between midstream and commodity prices, but midstream and upstream. Um, and that, that speaks, I think, well to the investment fundamentals around midstream right now. I'm going through the seven laws of pessimism from Martin Baudry in my Against Doomsdayism section. And we went in the first week with the uh, velocity of bad news, how quickly bad news spreads. Um, and, and we have talked about, uh, ba, ba, ba. hold on. Oh, excuse me. The first was, the, that's the number two. The first week was the 
invisibility of good news uh, relative to the immediate visibility of bad news. Then the second week was the velocity of bad news, how quickly it spreads. Today is what uh, he refers to as the law of rubbernecking, um, which is the more gruesome the news, the more we lap it up. There's sort of a human nature element here. I don't think it's sadistic, but I do think it's very sensationalistic. Um, and it really does play into our view of risk reward as well, that we're drawn to these things that have big numbers. And a lot of the positive news is not, how, you know, when you have a major earthquake tsunami, it hits tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people at once. But when you have um, growth in literacy over a century, it's also hitting pockets of people over a long period of time. There isn't the same sensationalism, both in magnitude or speed. And that just lends itself to bad news, um, capturing more headlines and capturing more of our mental uh, imaginations. Uh, the question to ask TBG today had to do with why we've gone from 8,000 publicly listed companies in the last 25 years to 4,000. And there isn't any real controversy about this, to my knowledge. There might be controversy as to what to do about it or if anything should be done about it. I don't know. Um, I always assume there's somebody out there with some really bad idea for something. Uh, but why it's happened is a no-brainer. That there just simply is a significant evolution in options in private markets for uh, monetization, for liquidity, and for just access to capital, where public markets often in the past had been one of the only ways companies could monetize founders, monetize early investors, create liquidity and exit, and then, of course, do secondary public offerings that generated primary capital for the firms that were in need of growth capital where now the massive growth in private debt, private uh, equity, venture capital, and other forms of financial market innovations have made it much less necessary to ever go public. And why go public if you don't need your stock as a currency when it invites so much more regulation, so much more disclosure, so much more um, liability, inconvenience, etc. So. I, I think that what it's done is made um, the valuation uh, and the attractiveness of buying IPOs very, very unattractive. I mean, companies are doing, when they used to go public at, let's say, like a D round of fundraising, they now go public at a G or H round of fundraising. And a lot of value creation took place within various steps of being a private company. So by the time they go public, a lot of the great money has already been made. And that was not always the way it was. I don't know if that's ever going to change. I don't know. I, don't, I never say never in my business, but um, it has no real impact the way we view things. It just changes some of the opportunity set and the timeline and the way you think about liquidity and exit strategy within private markets. Great question. Thank you for that, Fred. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. We've covered a lot of ground. I appreciate the long Monday opportunity to go around the horn with you. Uh, we'll have another market update and our normal Ask TBG questions and uh, what's on mine and Brian's mind over the next few days. And I'll see you back at the Dividend Cafe on Friday. Thanks so much for watching and listening and reading the Dividend Cafe. Mm -hmm.